Good morning, everyone. Good morning to all those gathered here and to our connecting congregation. And whether you are connected or you're here, we are all one, aren't we? Happy Easter. So exciting. This is my favorite Sunday. I love today because we are all victorious through Jesus Christ. We are celebrating him rising and conquering death. What I love about it is no matter what burdens you carry, trials, anxieties, and worries, and mental illness, and physical illness, today you get to lay that at the foot of Jesus. Lay that at the cross, and we get to rise victorious with him. My name's Kara. I have the privilege with a bunch of other wonderful women to teach Sunday school. And the first verse that we memorize is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, and that is made possible today. And it's amazing to see all these kids. It takes them a little bit. You know, we only meet once a week. 
Um, but it takes, you know, after about, it takes about 10 weeks. But after 10 weeks, they can, oh, right now, if I could have found them before the service, I would have had them line up. And they wouldn't have had to have it on the screen. They would have been able to say it right to you. And it's an incredible thing. So today, in that joyful and celebratory feeling, we can all rise and sing together.
precious Redeemer. Seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, but an unheeding, dying for me.
in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can gather together here on this Resurrection Sunday, on this blessed Easter morn, to celebrate you and your Son and your Holy Spirit, and to celebrate this wonderful fulfillment of this promise that you gave, this wonderful fulfillment of this incredible gift of love that was demonstrated in the gift and life and death and resurrection of your dear Son. So Heavenly Father, it is with great joy that we gather together and in thankfulness for this wonderful opportunity that we have to praise you, to worship you, to connect with you, and to be able to be reminded of not only what you have done, but what you have continued to do, not only in the past, but also in our present today, and what you have assured us of, of the future. And so we just pray that, Heavenly Father, you will be glorified. We pray for a oneness with the apostolate, and we are thankful for that wonderful ministry, and we just pray for their strength and for their wisdom to lead and guide us and to keep us ready so that our lamps are filled with oil in order for the day of your son's return, we will all be able to go on that great and glorious day. So Heavenly Father, though you know every situation and circumstance, you know every heart that is here and all that are connected from near and far, you know all that's taking place, all that they lay at your feet. And we just pray that Heavenly Father, you will provide a comfort and a peace that they can feel your presence in a very special way today and that they will know that they are loved, that they are prayed for, and that they can do this, that we can make it. And we can make it, Heavenly Father, not with our own strength, but with your strength. And we just pray that you'll give that strength to us in this day, and that, your, that resurrection power that allowed you to overcome the grave and the death and the evil one and hell. And Heavenly Father, we just pray that that will be evident and experienced by all of us in this day that we can rise above the trials and tribulations, that we can rise above the evil and the, and the tribulations, and that we can rise and, and keep our eyes focused on you in order that we can be prepared and ready when you will send your son. Please let that day be soon and take us home in grace. We love you so much, and in Jesus' name do we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, my dear beloved. It is so great to be with you here on this blessed Sunday. Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, and we wish you all a very blessed Easter as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have loving greetings from our chief apostle, our district apostle, and our apostle, and we have a wonderful Bible verse that comes out of the first book of Corinthians, the 15th chapter in verses 20 through 21, which read as follows. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Please be seated.
Easter morning. We are also able to have a Bible reading this morning that will come out of John, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 10 and 19 through 23. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together. And the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven then. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. My very dear congregation and those that are connected from near and far, we're glad you're here. We're thankful that we can be together and celebrate a resurrected Christ, a 
living God. He's not dead. We're not here to come worship some inanimate cross. We're not here to look at some rock. We're not here to look at something that is physical. We're look here to see something that is alive. That is our Savior, Jesus Christ. That is our Heavenly Father. And He shares Himself and He shows Himself. And we experience His presence through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we gather together today to celebrate this resurrected Christ, to recognize that we have a living God and that we also can be able to treasure that we have a loving Savior who loves every single one of us. And I look out into the congregation and you guys are all different. And we all look different. And we all are tall and short and old and young and this color and that color and we've got tattoos and we don't have tattoos and we're, we've got blonde hair and dark hair and we've got all these different things. And some of us have scratchy voices and we're supposed to sing today and now I can't and so it's driving me insane because I can't sing. But I assure you I'm singing with my heart and if I throw a few notes off, please forgive me already. But I'm thankful that we can sing with you in your hearts to the Heavenly Father in this wonderful and amazing time that we have. And Easter is special in so many ways. As, as priest Greg and I were preparing the last few weeks, we were thought, thinking to ourselves, what are you going to say on Easter? Because you could talk about everything. Everything in the Christian faith revolves around this day. And so that's why even as a shared leadership team, we always talk about Easter is the pinnacle of the, of the year. It's the most important day in the, in, in the, as Christians because today is the day that so many things took place. And that's why it brought so much joy to the disciples, so much joy to Mary as she able, was able to then see the Lord Jesus and hear his voice. And they, just like you and I, don't always understand how it happens or when it happens, or why it happens, but we know that who it happens, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He has come to save us. As the uh, youth choir sang so beautifully, he's come to save us, and that's why we lift his name on high. That's why we love being a part of his singing his praises. That's why we love being a part of this congregation. That's why we love sharing the gospel. It is good news. And we want to share that good news. And why is it good news? Because this is what the disciples experienced. First of all, they recognized that Jesus was with them again. For those of you that have lost somebody dear to you, you know what this is all about. You know what this is all about. So many times you say to yourself, if I could only have just five minutes with him again. Whether it's a mom or a daughter, whether it's a dad or a grandchild, whether it's a friend or a family member, you know how special this was for them. They had spent three and a half years dedicated and seen so many amazing things, and they realized how true of a friend Jesus was. They recognized how wise he was. They recognized how loving he was. They recognized how much respect and all he gave his father. They recognized that doing God's will was everything to him. And so they had, they had just come along, and they had realized how special that was. And then when... He was crucified. You can just imagine the devastation that they experienced. You can just imagine how it seems like evil was winning. And even the centurion, if you noticed on Good Friday service, the evangelist said, right, that this centurion even recognized and said, this truly was, was the Son of God. In a past tense. But I'm sure he was also going to find what was becomes is and will always be 
the Son of God. And so just having Jesus back with them, they didn't always understand it, right? Even as the Bible reading shared and as Kendra shared, as you, they were running there and they seen this and they get to the tomb and he's not there. They're thinking somebody stole him. They're thinking something's happened. And isn't it funny? This is us, isn't it? Jesus had told him like more, three times, if not many times. It records it three times specifically. But I'm sure he told him many times, hey, I'm going to die at the cross, and then three days later I'm going I'm to arise again. They probably told him a thousand times. And what happened? When it happened, they couldn't remember. But just imagine how enlightened they must have been when all of a sudden now they could see him they could touch him, they could hear his voice, and they recognized that he was with them. And that he had done exactly what he had told them he would do. And now, nothing could stop him. So that's the first joy that came from that resurrection day, is that the disciples were filled with joy because Jesus was with them. The second joy that came from this was that God, good had triumphed over evil. The evil one had thrown everything at him, hadn't he? He had thrown everything. He was brought out into the wilderness, and he was tempted. He was tempted with pride. He was tempted to shortcut God's will. He was tempted with power. He was tempted with everything. Wherever he went, there was somebody there trying to trick him. Everywhere he went, there was somebody trying to question him. He was faced constantly with battle after battle, trial after trial, evil after evil. Even in his own hometown, he went home. And they wanted to throw him over the cliff. And my dear brothers and sisters, and yet for them, just imagine how special that was now that they realize, because we get that way sometimes too. It seems like evil's winning in the world, right? We think that all hell's breaking loose. And certainly it is, I'm sure. If we only could see the spirits, I'm sure there's just all kinds of spirits. But in many ways, just think about how it was for those disciples, the joy that to know that what Jesus had promised them had been fulfilled and that good had triumphed over evil. And despite him, the evil one throwing everything at Jesus Christ, he was able to be the victor. And he was able to overcome every situation, every circumstance, every trial, every temptation. Because he was faithful to his God. He was faithful to his Father. And he did his Father's will until the very end out of great love that he had for him and great love that he has for you and I. Another joy that it was experienced was that the resurrection testified of God's omnipotence. You know, we hear that word all the time. God is omnipotent. God is omnipotent. God is omnipotent. And it sounds cool, it sounds nice, but until you experience it, you realize then all of a sudden it in, in an even greater joy. I'm sure when you got, you look at the uh, disciple, or I'm sorry, the Israelites, when they seen that the sea was parted and they went to the other side and they seen what had happened and how God provided for them and this great enemy, the largest enemy, the greatest enemy on the face of this earth was chasing them. There was nobody stronger or greater or mightier than the Egyptians at the time. And yet God swallowed them up just like that. Can you imagine the praise song that they were singing after seeing the omnipotence of God? Well, just imagine the praise song. Now you know why the youth had to sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. I love to sing your praises. This is why we want to sing, you are my strength and my all. Because he is the one that we look forward to, we look up to, we rejoice in. Because he has demonstrated God's omnipotence because he won the victory over hell, death, the grave. And just imagine how that must have been such an amazing experience for those dear disciples and still yet for us today as well. Another joy that came from this resurrection is that it testified that Jesus truly was is and always will be the Son of God. 
And this is so cool, and I never really thought about this. God had truly come into the midst of God's people. If he really was the son of God, and he really did overcome the grave and hell and the devil, then he also truly was the son of man. And he did truly come to be with us, to provide salvation, an opportunity for all of us, no matter what, how much of a sinner we are, no matter of our past, our present, but he's also assured us of a future. And it just shows his love and his care for us, doesn't it? That he was willing to send his son and that his son was willing to go. He gave his life. It wasn't taken from him. He gave it. And he gave it because he loved you and he loved me. And he wanted all of us to be together with the Father again in heaven. And so my dear brothers and sisters, this joy was not only a source of joy, but it also was a, so, a source of hope because Jesus Christ had fulfilled the will of God. He had fulfilled what he had promised them he would do. And so this hope is something that is really powerful because in our opening hymn it said here, in Christ alone my hope is found. I pray for every one of you today that your hope is found in Jesus Christ today. Because I know in this world today, we are in a hopeless environment. We are in a hopeless world, and it seems like everybody is struggling. Everybody is hurting. Everybody is lost. But I pray that all of us, all of us, you, that we can find our hope in Jesus Christ. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone is solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. And so, my dear congregation, Resurrection Sunday is also a celebration of hope. And why is that? Because Jesus proved that if we follow him, we can resurrect too. And isn't that encouraging for us? Because so often we think about, man, I'm failing, I'm failing, I'm failing, I'm failing. And I'll do a couple things right, and I'll do a couple things wrong, and I'll, I'll move forward a couple of steps, and then it seems like I go three steps back. And even the Apostle Paul talked about this, didn't he? He said, the things I want to do, I don't. The things I don't do, that I know I should, I do. And so that's what's so beautiful is our Heavenly Father says, your merit is not going to earn you salvation. But that's why I came. To give you hope. Because I love you. And I want you to be there. And I will be your hope. I will be the one that will find a way, make a way to allow us all to be able to be with him once again. And so that is bringing us tremendous hope, my dear brothers and sisters, for both those here in the land of the living, but also those in the land of the dead. Because the Apostle Paul, as he was speaking to the congregation at Corinth, there was all these questions about, is there truly a resurrection? Is there truly a resurrection of the dead? And so he, they were getting all the questions, because why? The evil one was still wasn't giving up. The evil one was still trying to, oh, did God really say? Did he really say? Yes, he did. He has won the victory. And now, my dear brothers and sisters, we must live in it. We must be filled with hope, knowing that we have a living God, and we have a loving Savior, and He's at the right hand of God, our Father, and He is our interceder. He is our... I'm struggling to find the words, and I'm sure maybe... Advocate. And there's another word that starts with a P, and for some reason I can't think of it right now. But he's there for us. And I think about the uh, chief apostle, and he says it in such a beautiful way. He says, you can do it. 
And he says it with this kind of French accent, and it's so, it's so cool. But he's he just reminding us, isn't he? The devil's telling us, you can't do it. The devil's telling you, you're not good enough. The devil's telling us, you're never going to make it. And Jesus is saying to you, I made it. And you're coming with me. And that's what, my dear brothers and sisters, is so profound for all of us, is to know that we have a Savior. I'm looking, I see you here. Between the, the, the palm leaves, I love you. I see you. He's saying, I'm with you. And I'm for you. And we're going to make it together. And my dear brothers and sisters, there's been so many wonderful examples. I can think back in the track and field for some reason is one of the fields that I remember. So many times there's been examples of where the runners were running. And then all of a sudden I remember one time this fellow from Africa was winning and he had run the race and he was way ahead of everybody. And he got to the last mile and he got so cramped up he couldn't move on. And the other racers came and they got together and they carried him and they went to the finish line together. My dear brothers and sisters, this isn't a competition. And I know we're competitive. I'm looking at my buddy over there, Chase, and we're, we're competitive, aren't we, right? We always want to win. But what's nice is Jesus already won, and he's wanting us to all run together, to work together, to love together, to serve together, to be a part of this wonderful work of love, because he wants us all to be with him. And that's what's so beautiful about this hope that when he fulfilled his promise is that there's all power for all people, those in eternity as well as those here. Because after all, think about it, those that have had terrible tragedies happen to them, don't they need hope? Those that are in foreign countries that have never heard of Jesus Christ, don't they need hope? How about you and I? We so many times can look at all of the faults and failings of everybody else in the world. But what about us? We need help. We need help and we need hope. And that's what's so beautiful is our Heavenly Father has his arms open and welcoming. As our worship leader said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should have everlasting life. And that's what the resurrection of Jesus Christ, why it also gives us hope is that because he has showed us if we are faithful to him and we follow him, we also can experience the goal. We also can experience and be ready for that day when he sends his son to take us all home again. And that is a tremendous amount of joy. And the other joy that comes and hope that comes from this is not based on a wish, my dear brothers and sisters. So often we hear that, don't we? There's a little song we sing, I when I wish upon a star. And so many people can say, I wish I had a million dollars, or I wish I had this, or I wish I had that. And there's no power in it, is there? There's absolutely no power in a wish. This is not wishful thinking. This is joyful anticipation. Joyful anticipation is you know what's going to happen, and you can't wait, and you're excited about it. And that's what we should have with this hope of Jesus Christ, is this joyful anticipation that we have a living hope in a living God that we can be a part of his beautiful plan of salvation. And as he proved everybody wrong, as he has overcome every power, as he has prepared a way and made a way for us all to be a part of that day of his son's return. My dear brothers and sisters, isn't it a beautiful opportunity for us that we can experience a revival? What is a revival? Revival is to come alive again, isn't it? When somebody has a heart attack and dies, and they bring them back with the, with the paddles, or they bring them back with CPR, what happens? They have been revived. They have come back alive again. 
And we need a revival in the church of Jesus Christ. We need a revival in the new apostolic church. We need a revival in this congregation. We need a revival in this community. We need a revival with old and a revival with young. We need a revival where we are all coming alive because he is alive, we are alive. And the devil keeps telling us that you're dead in your sins. He keeps telling you you're not good enough. He keeps telling you you can't make it. He keeps telling you that you're never going to be good enough. And yet our Savior says, you're good enough for me. And I want you. And I love you. And bring as many with you as you can. And so that's why we are filled with joy. That's why we are filled with hope. Because he is who he said he is. He done, did what he said he was going to do. He has done it out of love. He's done it out of faithfulness. And so this revival, when you think about the disciples before Jesus died on the cross and then resurrected, and you see the disciples after Jesus resurrected, they were completely different, weren't they? And it wasn't in a negative. They had even more faith. They had even more love. The resurrection of Jesus Christ fueled their passion for the Lord's work. It inspired them in their faith. It motivated them to get out and serve. It, it, it um, encouraged them in their walk of faith that no matter what they had done, because think about it, we always think about the disciples as perfect, right? They had just denied him. They had just abandoned him. They had just turned away from him. So they had the same feelings as all of us of inadequacy, of our faults and failings not being good enough. And my dear brothers and sisters, our Heavenly Father is giving us joy and hope this morning with our resurrected Christ, with our living God, with our loving Savior saying, you can do it. As he resurrected and won that victory, we also can resurrect and treasure that victory. As he showed tremendous love. My dear congregation, I pray that we can show tremendous love. Because I am really getting tired lately of so many in the Christian world beating up and tearing down this love that Jesus built. This church, this church of Jesus Christ was built out of love. And we are so thankful that he is the judge. He is the one that determines right from wrong. He is the one that set the way. And so we just follow it. Where are you at, Jesus? I'm with you. Where are you going? I'm with you. That's, my dear brothers and sisters, where that revival can come, that we have a renewed joy, that we have an um, invigorated faith, that we have a steadfastness. David prayed about that, didn't he? Create a clean heart in me, O God, and renew that steadfast spirit within me that I may follow you faithfully and fruitfully to the very end. We have a great joy in front of us, my dear brothers and sisters, that we don't forget what Jesus had told us, that we hold on to this joy and this hope in believing that we have a renewed faith, that we have an inspired faith, that we want to be a blessing in whatever way we can, and that we are going to stay steadfast and faithful to him and follow him wherever he goes. Makes it our job kind of easy, doesn't it? Follow Jesus. And yet it's often the hardest thing, isn't it? So easy to hit like and follow somebody on social media. But actually following somebody is much harder. And following Jesus Christ is a lifelong journey for all of us, isn't it? We're going to have our seasons, much like in our marriages, right? As our marriages stay high all the time? Do our friendships remain high all the time? No, we have to work at it, don't we? It's something that we got to be intentional sometimes to have date nights. we got to be intentional to get together as friends. we got to be intentional to work on that relationship because we need this relationship. He is our strength, our stay. And isn't it beautiful how Philippians 4.13 remind us of that? I can do all things 
through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let us keep building on this relationship with our Heavenly Father. And we're going to have our highs and lows. But don't give up. Jesus is saying, I still love you. Please, come to me. Please, I want you. I haven't forgotten you. You're still good enough for me. I still want you in the kingdom of heaven. I still want us all to be together. And let us come to him and follow him. And let that joy and that hope, just as the disciples experienced many, many years ago, be something that moves in us, revives us, and we start coming alive again. And we stop seeing things through the world this way. And we start seeing the world through this way, through his way. Then, my dear brothers and sisters, we can share the good news. We can not only share it, but we can be it. Amen. Amen. If the, uh, go ahead. You're invited to rise as a congregation, and together we'll sing Crown Him with Many Crowns, hymnal 510. morning and blessed Resurrection Sunday, dear brothers and sisters, those connected as well. As the evangelist served, he brought out, like he said, that there's so much that could come out because this is everything. What took place here is the foundation of the entire Christian faith. But he went on to speak and, and really it, it pointed out that this day is a day of hope and of joy. Hope and joy. And the evangelist pointed out that in this world today, there is certainly a lot of hopelessness. And there are many that don't have much joy. And it's not just out in the world, but we could find ourselves in those positions as well, where we're going through a situation, a circumstance in life where we maybe feel hopeless, where we feel like we don't have any joy. And I had to think back on a story that took place here in the 24th chapter of Luke, and it speaks of two disciples who were without hope and joy, and they were confused, and they just didn't know what was going on, and they're uh, pretty, they're pretty relatable. But on their journey, they encountered the risen Christ. And here in Luke 24, it starts in the 13th verse, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we're going to journey through it a little bit. But here there's these, these two disciples, they were traveling on a road to a city, a village called Emmaus. And they were talking together, and, you know, misery loves company, right? <laughs> and they were commiserating, and they were talking about all these things that had happened. And then Jesus, the risen Lord, appears to them. And they don't recognize that it is him at first. And he comes to them and he says in the 17th verse, and he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? You know, I had to think back on, it's going way back to Genesis when, you know, Adam and Eve had sinned and God comes into the garden and he says, where are you? Right? He knew where they were. 
Right? He comes to them and says, what, what are you talking about? He knows what they were talking about. He wasn't unaware of this. And then they say to him, it was Clepis said, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not heard, basically, have you not heard what had happened? And he says to them, what things? <laughs> right again, he knew what things had happened. He knew what was going on. But then it's interesting because then he goes on and speaks to them after they empty their hearts and souls and they tell them everything that's going on and they tell them that there's feelings and express everything that they've been hopeless and joyless and confused about. And he says, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He began to preach to them and speak to them and tell them all these things that have, that have taken place in the Old Testament and what had to take place for him to do, to die on the cross for them. And they still didn't realize it was him. And then they had the chance to celebrate Holy Communion. And he broke bread. And then they realized, weren't our hearts burning when he was speaking to us, when he was preaching to us? What does this have to do with us? Like I said, sometimes we find ourselves in those hopeless, joyless, confusing situations. And we come to the Lord, and we speak to him, and we pray, and we tell him, Lord, I don't know what's going on. Lord, I'm hopeless. I'm joyless. I'm confused. And just like here, he already knows. He already knows. And what's amazing when you look at what they experienced here, these disciples essentially experienced the first divine service experience. Because here they came in and they didn't recognize him, right? They saw this man before him and they had opened their hearts and souls in prayer. And then he speaks to them and so too for us, we speak to him and then we come into the house of God and then there before us stands a man. And do we not recognize that even though that's a man, do we not recognize the risen Lord? He speaks to us, and he preaches to us, and he tells us these things as we heard today. You, too, will have a resurrection. You have hope. You have joy. Because you have a future with me. Do we recognize that? Does that uplift us? And then we come and we experience the Lord breaking bread, that we could partake of his body and his blood. And then what happens here in the story? Right? They didn't just experience this and say, wow, this was amazing. And then they went home and thought, well, that was great for me. I'm so glad that I experienced that. No. It goes on a little bit further. And it says in verse 33, So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed. So when we come and we experience the risen Lord, we don't just keep that to ourselves. We go out to others and we can say, The Lord is is risen indeed. The Lord loves you indeed. The Lord has called you indeed. You can resurrect too indeed. We share this wonderful hope, this wonderful joy that we experience with the risen Lord with others. That they too, that they too can experience that hope and that wonderful future with us, with him, when he comes again to resurrect us. Amen. Amen. It was interesting <clears throat> in our Bible reading <clears throat> when she got to the part there where the disciples went into the tomb. And it said, then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloth lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together 
in a place by itself. In Jewish tradition, when the master of the house was done eating, he would take his handkerchief and he would crumple it all up and just kind of throw it on the plate and leave. But if he folded it up, it meant he was coming back. And my dear brothers and sisters, what a hope that is for us. It seems like evil is winning. It seems like there ain't no way we're able to go. We're going to be able to go, right? We got, there's a long way for us to get there. And yet out of God's love and out of God's power, and because we believe, 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 believe and know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we now have an opportunity as we prepare for Holy Communion. It's beautiful how it says in John, the 11th chapter. Verses 23 through 25, it says here, when Martha and came to Jesus, and Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And so Jesus then responds to her. This is at the tomb of Lazarus. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And so my dear congregation, that's the question that we have to ask ourselves. We are reported, repeatedly given this opportunity in Holy Communion to show that we believe that he is the resurrection and that we can believe that he in him is life. And what's so, I think, the powerful thing that comes from Holy Communion that comes from this day, Resurrection Sunday, is Jesus is not only the giver of life, he is the giver of eternal life. Because Jesus didn't transform into his natural body again. He was in the resurrected body. And yet he was able to experience fellowship with the brothers and sisters, wasn't he? When he came into their midst, in their presence, they were like, he looks like him, he sounds like him, and they were unsure. Do I really, is this really the Christ? And he held out his hands and he said, touch me, feel me, feel these, these, these holes. And so my dear brothers and sisters, that's us sometimes. Sometimes we're at that, that low point in our faith where we're kind of wondering, is this really and truly the son of God? Is he really gonna do what he said he's gonna do? Is good gonna ultimately win the victory? And we can have all of these doubts, but doubt your doubts. Because I can assure you there's hope in Jesus Christ and I can assure you there's power in Holy Communion. As the song sings, there's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. We have this now blessed opportunity to have this presence and this fellowship and this connection and this worship of Jesus Christ. And so in preparation for this, our choir will now prepare the way.
As a believing congregation, let us now rise together and pray together the prayer the Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the commission of my sender, the Apostle, do I proclaim unto you the glad tidings, that in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, your sins are forgiven, and the peace of the risen one abide with you. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are humbled when we consider all that you have done for us. We feel so unworthy. And yet the more we contemplate it, the more that you teach us of your beautiful plan of salvation, the more amazing it becomes, the more beautiful it becomes, how special it is, how treasured this moment really is. Heavenly Father, we cherish you. We love you. And we are so thankful that we can have this fellowship with you. Bless us now that we can experience the fullness of your grace and blessing. And we just pray that you will be magnified in our hearts, our souls, our minds, our bodies, and our spirits. We love you so much. And in Jesus' name, amen. amen. And now we shall celebrate Holy Communion. And now the Lord's table is prepared. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I consecrate bread and wine for Holy Communion and lay there upon the once brought, eternally valid sacrifice of Jesus Christ. For the Lord took bread and wine, he gave thanks, and he said, this is my body which is broken, which is broken for you. This is my blood of the new covenant, given for many for the remission of sins. Eat and drink and do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this wine, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. The body and the blood of Jesus given for you. Amen.
the Lord now invites you for Holy Communion.
Let us rise and close the service in a prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we thank you for this congregation, this congregation of souls that love you, this uh, congregation, and we are not perfect by any means, but we are just thankful that we have a perfect God in you. We are thankful that you have loved us with an everlasting love. You have been faithful and loyal and steadfast and long-suffering. And for that, Heavenly Father, we have to give you praise. We have to express the proper glory to you. Because, Heavenly Father, you are everything and we are nothing. But, Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be called a child of God. We are so thankful that we can come under word and sacrament and to be able to believe all over again. That as we even look down at the wafer and we can see those three drops of blood and that alpha and omega and we can experience how you join with that, that unleavened bread that we can be able to be given the strength and the power and the life that can only come from you. Please, Heavenly Father, let that germinate within us. Let that invigorate us, let it inspire us, let it revive us, let it move us closer to you, no matter how far away we are, that we can make our steps towards you, Heavenly Father, and even as those disciples, when the, your words burned in their heart and they experienced that fellowship, that they longed then to be in fellowship with their brothers and sisters of faith, Heavenly Father, that is our desire as well. So we want to thank you for the incredible gift of grace we want to thank you for loving us so dearly and for sending your son, your precious son. And we want to thank you, too, that we can bring our offerings and we just pray that you'll bless them and let them serve to fuel your mission and provide, Father, that which is needed to be a blessing in this community, in this congregation, in this time. We love you so much, Heavenly Father. Please let your son come soon and take us home in grace. And in Jesus' name do we pray. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You can be seated. Our worship leader now will...
Not sure what that noise was. 